Hello everyone and welcome to Medford Anywhere Learning TV. We're glad you're tuned in. We want to give a shout out to our friends at Southern Oregon PBS, KTVL, KDRV, and the Dove Network. Thank you for hosting us on your station. In the Medford School District, we have one shared vision and that we believe that all are learning and learning is for all. And what better place to do that than right here on Medford Anywhere Learning TV. I'm Justin Eager. I'm a construction technology teacher at South Medford High School. And today we're going to talk about the functions of a toilet, hopefully the proper functions of a toilet. So there are some things that a toilet should do, right? Usually get rid of what you don't want. So we're going to talk about if your toilet's not functioning the way it should and what we're going to do to fix it. So now we're going to take a look inside the tank to see how that functions. Get the water from the tank down into here in the bowl. This is the tank of a toilet. This is the flapper. This is what releases the water to flush the toilet. Okay, so the biggest problem that we have with a toilet is a running toilet. A running toilet means that water continually is filling up the tank. If it's filling up the tank, that means that water has to be going somewhere. So there's a little trick that we can figure out if your flapper, the part that releases the water, is functioning the way it's supposed to. So the flapper holds the water in. One thing that you can do to check to see if the flapper is working properly is add a little food coloring to the tank. I always use blue because red is disturbing to see in your toilet. You mix that up and we can check our bowl. So if your flapper is working properly, the blue is gonna stay in the tank. If you start to see some of this blue seeping down into the bowl, that means that your flapper has a little bit of a leak. There we see some blue coming and that means our flapper needs to be replaced. So the next thing we're going to do is replace the flapper and show you how that's done. It's really easy. Okay, so the flapper can be replaced without turning the water off. You're just going to lose water through the toilet as you're doing it. So you reach in here and you pop these tabs off. And you release the chain from the handle. That's our faulty one. Let me get the good one. And just in reverse order. So you hook the chain back up to the handle. And go ahead and snap that back in place. It's replaced. So the next, next problem that you can have with your toilet tank is your fill valve is not stopping the water from filling up the tank. There's a really easy way to see if that's what's happening. Let's take a look. So you can see the water is overflowing into the overflow tube. That will cause your toilet to run. That means your fill valve is not stopping the way it should be. So you can either adjust the valve or sometimes you just need to replace it altogether. All right, the most important part of this process is turning off the water before you start. Everyone's forgotten how to do that every once in a while, but it's this valve right here. The next thing you're gonna do is disconnect this water. You are gonna get some water out of the tank when you take this apart, so it's good to have a towel or a bucket or something to catch that water if it's in your bathroom. I'm working here in the shop, so I'm gonna let it fall on the ground. I'm gonna disconnect the top side of this supply valve. You may need a wrench for that but this one is nice and loose. There's a nut right at the bottom of the fill valve now, but if you push down, sometimes you can get that to break loose. Not today. All right, so then you reach in your back pocket and grab your wrench. You wanna be really soft on these nuts because they are plastic. So you always remember righty tighty lefty loosey to get this off. Once you've got this nut all the way off, you can come to the top side and this fill valve just pulls right out. So here's our fill valve. There's a million different kinds of fill valves. Some of them have a little arm with a bubble. This one has a little float next to it. They are all adjustable, uh, but most of them come from the factory set to pretty much how you want them. 
So we're going to put this new one back in the tank. All right, so we're pretty much going to go in reverse order here. We get this fill valve in there. We get that tightened up hand tight. And you want to make sure that that rubber O-ring is on the top side of the tank. And as you push down on the fill valve, you can hand tighten it just a little bit more before you get a wrench on it. Okay, once that's tight, we can reconnect our supply line. Once that supply line is all the way connected, this has got to go in our overflow tube. What that does is that keeps a little bit of water going through the toilet while the tank is filling up, keeps it functioning the way it's supposed to. We're all ready to turn it back on. Okay, as it's filling, we want to keep checking for leaks to make sure we don't flood our bathroom. As the water gets to the float, you'll see that this little arm raises up, and that's what's going to shut your water off when it gets there. So at the end of this arm, there's a Phillips head where you can adjust the water level in the tank. You turn it to the left, that brings the water level down. Turn it to the right, and that brings the water level up. All right, we've hit the basics of this toilet, making sure that it's not running, making sure that it's flushing properly. Now we're gonna check your water heater. Okay, now we're gonna tackle an electric water heater. Now, just a warning, this is a very basic overview. This is not gonna go into the depths of how they, how they completely function but it's going to give you a chance to check your elements, make sure you're getting hot water, um, and see if you need to maybe hire a professional for this one. We'll get there. So the tools that we're going to use today, a multi-use screwdriver, channel lock pliers. I've got an element wrench, which are uh, really inexpensive at Home Depot or Lowe's. I'm going to show you a multimeter, but you can also use a less expensive version, which is the uh, element tester. The first thing you want to do is shut the water off to your water heater. There should be a valve right here where it connects to the wall. Go ahead and close that. Then you're going to go to your breaker box and you're going to turn off the power to your water heater. It's really important that you turn off the power to your water heater because electricity hurts. Now that you've turned off power to the water heater, you want to double check that you've turned off power to the water heater. That's where a multimeter comes in. We're gonna turn it to voltage. And we're gonna put one of these, make sure it connects with the metal inside each one of these. If you wanna take the wire nuts off and connect it just to make sure, it's probably a good idea. It's showing no voltage, which means that we are ready to work on a water heater. We're gonna get into this top panel inside the water heater and check to make sure that the elements are working. The elements of a water heater are what heat up the water. They run electricity through them and there's some resistance in there similar to an incandescent light bulb where that electricity heats up the metal. The metal then heats up the water. There's one up here and there's one on the lower section of the water heater that we'll get to in just a second. This is your thermostat. We're not going to mess with that too much besides just that red button right there. That red button is a fail safe. So if that is clicked, then it means that there was a high temperature problem or something else wrong with the thermostat. And you probably have a professional look at it. Next thing we're going to check is the element. So it's got power coming in, power going out. And we're going to take those wires off. So this is a water heater that doesn't have any water in it, but you will want to drain your water heater before you open this up. This is an access into the inside of the tank. If you do not 
drain the water out. You're going to get a lot of water on your floor. We take the element wrench, which is just a big hex, and we fit it over that. And we use our pliers. To slowly bring it out. So this is what an element looks like. Power goes through this, it heats up, and it heats your water. One thing we can check, actually we can check it while it's still in there, is we're gonna check resistance. and Make sure that that's connected. This is a element tester, and you just touch it to one side and the other. If the element is good, this will light up. Obviously this one needs to be replaced. A lot of times with a broken element, you'll actually see where it's been broken and it's just worn out and the metal has gotten tired and it's broken. So once you get a new one, you'll put that in. Make sure you don't cross thread that because that can be a little bit tricky. And we're gonna get our element wrench back on there, hand tight, and then wrench tight. There's a washer in there, so we don't need to get crazy tight with it. Just tight enough it doesn't leak. All right, so with an element, any wire can go to each one. So you just, whichever one's closest, put that wire on there. Tighten it up. And that is replaced. Important piece of information. If you don't fill this with water before you turn the power back on, your element will explode. It's a very small explosion, but it's still an explosion. So this is your lower element. It looks a lot like the upper element. It functions a lot like it. The elements never work at the same time. So either this one's working or this one's working, but never at the same time. Sometimes you'll, uh, your water heater will act like it has less heat capacity that means one of your elements is usually bad when that happens. Um, if you're not getting any hot water, it can just be one element at the same time. It might be both, or it might be your thermostat. Thermostat's probably something to let a plumber tackle, uh, but the elements are something a homeowner can do. So it's the same process for this lower one. If you need to replace it, um, just make sure your power's off. If you notice that your water heater is just not warm enough, there is an adjustment here where you can go from hot all the way up to very hot. This increases your capacity a little bit because at the shower, you're gonna be adjusting that temperature. So it'll make your showers last a little bit longer if you do that. You do wanna be careful of scald protection. So if you've got any little kids in the house, you don't wanna crank that up because they can hurt themselves really really quickly with that hot water. So we're gonna put this, valve, this cover back on. Okay, we're gonna turn this imaginary valve up here, fill this with water. Once that's full of water, we're gonna go to our closest sink, turn on the hot side, and let that run until there is no more air coming out. Once we've got the air out of the tank, we can go back to our breaker box, turn the power back on. So the water heater should heat up the water in about 40 minutes, uh, at the longest amount of time. This wonderful thing is called a water heater please don't call it a hot water heater because it heats cold water to become hot. So the life of a water heater is generally between 20, 10 and 15 years. Uh, if the tank itself is damaged or leaking, it's usually just a replacement. Uh, most 
parts can be replaced, but you get to a point where you're adding more money to it than it's worth. Uh, after about 15 years, you want to look at replacing it. That range is usually between $1,000 and $1,200. So for you students that are wanting to tackle your water heaters at home, ask your parents' permission first. Make sure you're safe. Make sure somebody's supervising you. Make sure the power's off. Those are all very important things. If replacing an element doesn't do the trick, then it's probably time to call a plumber. There's plenty of plumbers in the valley, and they're all happy to help you. So today we looked at a toilet, how to check if the flapper is working properly, how to make sure that the fill valve is working like it should, and showed how to replace both of those if we need to. We looked at our electric water heaters and how to check the elements, replace those if we need to, as well as the bottom element. If it's too complicated for you, maybe just don't tackle it. You can call a plumber, but you have the knowledge in the back of your head. This is Medford Anywhere Learning TV. Thanks for tuning in to Medford Anywhere Learning TV. Medford School District is a place where all are learning, and learning is for all. Pathways program allows students to express what their unique interests and abilities are and then allows the educational system to create programs that matches that and ultimately prepares them for the next step after graduation. We want to move beyond the in-school learning. We need to make connections to the world of work so that students have an opportunity to really apply their emerging learning. We need to make sure that our educational offerings match those diverse needs and interests and match the diverse workforce needs of our community. Perfect example, within our construction technology program, students can specialize in plumbing so they could leave high school and join a plumber's apprenticeship. For me and a lot of employers, Pathways fills a hole. And that hole is that a large number of kids will not go to college right out of high school. College education is a wonderful thing. And at the same time, some kids just aren't ready to do that. So that's the big gap that this whole effort in the Medford School District is trying to, to plug. The construction tech program has changed school for me. I can actually connect with the teacher and gain ideas of what I can do in the future. If you can complete a project start to finish on your own, the feeling of getting it done is just amazing. I'm excited to go out today and meet a local business. I feel like I might be able to really connect with him because I will have a basic idea of what he's talking about and possibly gain a mentorship out of it. Pathways consist of these broad categories, academic, career and technical education, pre-professional, and visual and performing arts. Traditional K-12 systems you could call one-size-fits-all model, where the real legitimate end is a four-year college degree after high school. The truth is that model's inadequate to meet the needs of education and workforce in the 21st century. A four-year college degree is tremendous, but it isn't the answer for everyone. What is the answer ultimately is, what is my unique set of interests and abilities, and how can the educational system prepare me to use those in the world of work? Our goal then isn't to try to conform students to the same model. Our challenge and our interest in the Pathways Initiative is to engage those diverse interests and match them with high demand, high skill, career options. I love the Pathways program. I didn't have it when I was in high school and I wish I had. I took a long path to find where I wanted to go. If we can shorten that for students, that's going to be great. Pathways programs really provide more experiences for students. They have something that they can look forward to that's right up their alley, that interests them, that they can see that connection to real life and really keeps them connected to graduate. I like being able to explore things that I like to do at school. It makes school more fun in general because I love going to those classes. Gaining that experience now during high school can help me afterwards because when I graduate, I can always count on having that as a career choice. They can get some hands-on experience. They can really start to delineate where their interests lie. If they thought, oh, I think I'm interested in culinary, and they take culinary and they really are, getting them to those visits to those colleges before they're out of high school, or if they think they're interested in early education, connecting them with local elementary schools to do some practicum and internship to really see is this my fit. I've been interested in child education pretty much my whole life. I've always wanted to become a teacher. It's nice to be able to see the kids every day, kind of like the highlight of my day. Really exciting to be able to have that interaction. It 
definitely makes me want to come to school more. Pathways program is great for students. It really prepares us for our future with being able to have these hands-on experiences. The Pathways program, I think, is really beneficial. We're very fortunate that South Medford is providing these opportunities to learn about the different trades. I like the kinesthetic part of it. Being able to build something on your own is really cool to me. Look forward to going to those classes a lot. I've got friends in the field that are saying, as soon as they turn 18, I want to hire them. Whether they're still in school or not, I'll hire them after school because there's so much need for employees. There's opportunity to go out and start businesses right away. I have a nephew who started a landscape business right out of high school, and he's doing better than a lot of his peers. Not all the businesses out there require a degree. In fact, I would say less than half. The idea behind a credential diploma within Pathways is that students can earn community college or other college credit while in high school, which benefits the student, economically benefits them in terms of their toe in the water in post high school education. In addition, a student could earn an industry recognized credential. An example in manufacturing is a certified production technician. If a student in high school earns their certified production technician credential, they have several steps ahead in earning a high wage, high demand job. They're advantaged in that job search because of the skill that they're able to show they have. And we want to provide our students an opportunity to earn that industry credential because it allows them to get a, a foot forward in terms of employment. It distinguishes them in the race to get a job. Wherever the student decides that they would best apply their unique gifts and abilities, we want to create that opening into the world of work. One of my best days as a parent. One of my best days as a parent. One of my best days as a parent. As a parent. <laughs> <laughs> One of the best days is when my kids came home and say, Mom, I love school. She immediately comes home and she starts talking to me about, we get to go to lunch like every day. Like, <laughs> so I was like, you do that at home. But for her, it was amazing. When my son was in kindergarten and he came home from school early in the year with the Bob books and he sat down in my lap at night before bed and read for the first time to me and I got teary-eyed. Uh, I'll never forget it. One of my best days as a parent is when my son came home from school and said he wanted to run to be the class president for this school. And my daughter brought home this piece of artwork that says, friends help each other when they're scared. It's a friend telling her other friend, it's okay, be brave. One of my best days as a parent was the day that my son came home and said that he was chosen for a student leader award. It's, it was a really good feeling, actually, you know? Um, like a one, a one of a kind feeling, for sure. Uno de los grandes momentos también de este programa. One of the biggest moments when I came home was that I came home and I told her that um, through Bulldog Straders I had spoken to the governor of Oregon, and she was really proud of me because at a young age I had this really big opportunity, um, and it was just so um, motivating to me like it was to her as well. My favorite thing was to hear another friend of mine that's a teacher. She asked him, so how do you like middle school? Do you like it? And he said, I love it. And I was like, what? Yes. You know, to love something, you know, school, then that makes it more fun to go to and he'll put more energy into it. I got phone calls from the school and emails from um, different newspaper people saying that my son had created something. Yeah, basically just said it just, I created a little piece off this machine that creates, you know, 3D imaging things. I, he used other words, but uh, I'm a mom and I just like was just so excited that I was like, I don't know what words you're using, but cool, I'm so proud of you. My daughter, Tiana Crick, uh, she's um, a, going into her senior year um, at South Medford High School, and uh, she was born with Down syndrome. And so one of my best days as a parent um, with Tiana is when she came home after her first uh, game with the Unified team. She played soccer in the fall. And, uh, and she came home just really excited. She felt like she really was playing for South Medford High School and that made her really happy and really proud. One of my best days as a parent is when my son won state and was able to travel to Kentucky to participate in Skills USA Nationals 2017 in mobile electronic robotics. You know, I get choked up when I think about my kids, both of them, but you know, it's exciting to see that they're excelling and 
I know, I know now. And, and I've got to say that um, the programs that he's been involved in um, through CTE are huge and, and instrumental in his future. This is the whole soccer team. So we have the JV and the, the varsity and the JV team. Yeah, and, and Stephen participated on, oh, I see him. Yeah, he's right there. This is a pretty special poster for us. It's been a really long journey for Stephen and this proves to me that people really care. Stephen didn't have to come home and tell me, Mom, I made it. This is what people calling me and saying, we want, to, we want people to know your story and printing it and him, join, um, him making the team is, is all I needed. I didn't need words. I'm Patrick Royal's dad and uh, Patrick grew up when he grew up, I was in the military. So Patrick was in 10 schools before he enrolled here at South Medford. When he came to enroll uh, in classes his senior year, his counselor uh, knew what he wanted and encouraged him to enroll in the Champs Leadership Program. He did that and he was thrilled. That was a game changer for him, really. And then also Jefferson really um reaches out to Alejandro for, he's go, waiting for a kidney transplant and his school is so involved, really feels like we're at home. <laughs> My son is the third generation to go to Oak Grove. The teachers are great, they, they really are. When the teachers have a strong support staff, it's gonna trickle down definitely to the, to the kids. We're excited to see our children get molded by such great staff and you know we can do what we can at school or at home as parents but when we send them to school with you guys that you um, continue molding them into being good uh, citizens and and students and pretty soon he'll be an adult. Stephen has a place and now I can I feel like I can just kind of relax and and know that everything's gonna be okay. Believe me sometimes you cannot uh, say enough words to say thank you because they put more time than what you think. Not only the teachers, the counselors, the, uh, the registrar, the, the people that get the kids enrolled and get them moving, obviously it goes all the way up through the administration to the principal and, and to the superintendent. Thank you all. Thank you from the bottom of my heart as a parent that you're raising such wonderful children because it makes a huge difference in their lives and in our lives. And I hope that you have a successful year and I hope that you find kindness in every one of your days too. I want to give a big, big, big thank you to the school staff. And know that what you do and the positive things you do um, goes a long way. I really do. I think it does. I am an educator. I am an innovator. I am an innovative educator. I will continue to ask what is best for learners. With this empathetic approach, I will create and design learning experiences. I'm an educator. I'm an innovator. I believe that my abilities, intelligence, and talents can be developed, leading to the creation of new and better ideas. I recognize that there are obstacles in education, but as an innovator, I will focus on what is possible today to make way for even richer possibilities for tomorrow. I am an educator. I am an innovator. I will utilize the tools that are available to me today, and I will continue to search for new and better ways to grow, develop, and share my thinking while creating and connecting my learning. I focus not only on where I can improve, but where I am strong and what I can do to help develop those strengths in myself and others. I am an educator, I am an innovator. I build upon what I know, but I do not limit myself for my students. I embrace knowledge, and I'm continuously asking questions that allow my students and myself to move forward. I'm an educator, I'm an innovator. I question thinking, challenge ideas, and do not accept this is the way we've always done it as an acceptable answer for my students or for myself. I'm an educator, I'm an innovator. I model learning and leadership I seek in others. I take risks, 
try new things, develop and explore new opportunities. 